Hey, do you guys know this little chorus? I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes. If you know what, sing it. <laughs> I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes. Where you lead me, I will go. I say yes, Lord. I say yes. I'll say yes, Lord. I say yes to your will, Lord. I say yes where you lead me. I will go. I say yes, Lord, I say yes. Amen. Lord, we say yes to you this morning. God, as you lead, God, we set our hearts to follow. God, we don't want to get ahead, and God, we don't want to lag behind, but Lord, we want to be right in step with you. So Lord, have your way. God, anoint your word. God, your message from your heart to your people. God, for your glory. God, and anoint your messenger, God, with your power. God, and with your spirit, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm not nervous at all. Don't worry. I always do this. <laughs> and for those watching online, there's nothing wrong with your screen. It's a glare off a bald head. <laughs> so... I'll uh, give you some disclaimers about myself. I'm weird, okay? I feel like everybody's looking at me from the side. I guess they kind of are, so uh, y'all don't laugh if I back up and fall down. But uh, So I'm OCD, and I'm ADD, so sometimes my mind gets a little crazy at times. Uh, and uh, usually the front row... In this area are the expensive seats. I sweat and I spit. <laughs> so you guys, <clears throat> there are toilet seat covers in the bathroom if you need to, to bib up, and uh, you're in the splash zone. So, now I don't know. If, if I do, I'm sorry. If I get you, it might be the gum or the cough drop. Uh, I was out with a dear brother one time. We were eating lunch, talking about the word, and, and he spits a lot, and he eats. Uh, he talks a lot while he eats, and, man, he was talking, and, man, this chunk just came right out. <laughs> wow, right on my lip. And, I mean, it was, if I would have looked down, it was probably visible. But I just said, bless him, Lord. And I waited until he looked away, and then I wiped it off. Uh, so if I get you, just wait till I look away and then wipe it off. All right? All right. Well, we're glad to be here this morning. Uh, we've been here, I think, next, next Saturday or next Sunday would be a year. And we are very grateful to be here. Uh, my daughter, who's here, she turns 20 today. It's her birthday. Uh, so we were praying on the way in this morning, and, and she began to pray. And she said, Lord, thank you for putting us here. Uh, so I don't have an iPad, I have a notepad, and uh, so we'll be going with that this morning. Uh, as pastor, and, and thank you for the opportunity, by the way, and thank you for your care for my family, and especially myself, uh, over the last year, uh, and I just appreciate that. Many of you guys, uh, especially men, uh, Kevin and Rob and uh, Alex and Greg and, and, and others have uh, been an encouragement to, to myself and uh, just thankful for your friendship. But as the pastor asked, uh, gave the opportunity to speak, I began to prepare this message. I immediately knew this message was it. And then from this, it began to go a certain direction. And I started to go that direction. And the Lord made it very clear that it was two sermons. So we divided that. And we're going with the original this morning. And that is uh, called Follow Me. <clears throat> so first I want to read Matthew uh, 16. 13 through 16, all right? 
I usually preach out of the New King James. This today is the New King James and this Bible. It will be a prop today because I have it printed out on the NIV since that's what we usually hear. Uh, And I've been trying to get more familiar with that myself. So uh, it says, when Jesus came to the region of uh, Caesarea, say it, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, "Who uh, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now the reason I read this first is because I believe this is the question that every soul on the face of the earth is confronted with. If you can simplify the gospel down to a few things, it would be this. Who do you say that Jesus is? And there's a lot of responses to that question. The the disciples, Jesus' disciples began to give an explanation that many said, Hey, you're a great teacher. Hey, you're a prophet. Hey, you may even be uh, Jeremiah or Elijah or one of these guys brought back and walking in that same anointing. But that's not the correct answer. Jesus looks at us and says, Who do you say that I am? Each one in this place, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, Jesus has looked at you and is looking at you and says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter had the proper response. He had the the right response from his heart. It welled up and he said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Amen? Praise God. Now, if you wanted to sum that up a little bit more, and for those of us that are believers, now listen, I'm going to be speaking to believers and unbelievers today. So if you're lost today, if you're an unbeliever, you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, make sure you're paying attention. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, please make sure you're paying attention, okay? Because this applies to all of us. It applies to me. We're here today based on this message, follow me. Not because I've preached it before, but that's what we are called to do. As you work down through Matthew 16, for those of us who have put our faith and trust in the Lord, and for those of us who haven't, when when the Lord is tugging at your heart, and let me tell you something, we have been in the presence of the Lord this morning. You don't need this man, bald and ugly as he may be, spit flying to tell you who God is, because God is perfectly capable and has manifested and revealed himself in this place by his presence and his majesty. And if you will soften your heart and tender, uh, and let your heart be tender before the Lord, you will hear him say, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And for those of us who will give a positive response and that correct response, and those of us who have, who say you are, the, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the conversation continues. As you move down at Matthew 16, you get to verse 24, and then Jesus says this. And then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. And follow me. There is the initial question, who do you say that I am? And for those that say you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, then Jesus looks at us and he says, then follow me. Follow me. You could add a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot of responses to the question of who do you say that I am, but there's a whole lot of questions of what people would say, uh, what that requires and what that looks like. But Jesus just simply says this, follow me. And the only way you can follow him is to deny yourself, take up your cross. I think it's Luke's gospel, Luke's version of this, and maybe chapter 9. He says he takes up his cross daily and follow me. By the way, another disclaimer, I'm not angry. I'm passionate. I meant to say that. I'm not angry. Uh, and and uh, so anyway, that's out of the way. I'm not angry. Uh, and I get weird facial twitches when I preach all kinds of stuff. So if you see those, just ignore them, okay? Uh, anyway, weird brain in. Okay. Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. And the way I laid out this, this message, initially it was about nine points, and, and, and Pastor Ron said, it has to be eight. And he said, you only have till 1.30 to preach. <laughs> and I said, okay. And so we narrowed it down. 
And, but this morning I woke up and I felt like the Lord said, everything you've written down, I want you to simplify it and I want you to flip it. So I'm preaching this message backwards as of this morning. All right? I'm up here preaching. I've been called to preach since I was 13 years old. That does not make me a man of God. I've been raised in the charismatic Pentecostal movement all my life. That does not make me a man of God. I've operated in various gifts of the Spirit. It does not make me a man of God. I've been a part of two church plants and planted with a dear brother, two churches uh, uh, over, since 2001, two church plants and served in, in, a, in another church in between those two plants. That does not make me a man of God. My theological degree or lack thereof does not make me a man of God. You want to know what a man of God looks like? You want to know what a woman of God looks like? You want to know what a young person of God looks like? It's someone who follows Jesus. Is somebody that follows Jesus. Because we try, to, we try to make it more complicated than it is. There's the heart response to who Jesus is, and then it's simply start to follow him. Start to follow him. You don't have to have a Ph.D. to turn the world upside down. You don't have to have a fancy building to pack the place out. You don't think so? Talk to Pastor Betty sometimes when she's talking about those crusades and it's packed out and they're out in fields and they're out in rain and they're out in the, You know what? God's doing a marvelous thing. Why? Because she set her heart to follow the Lord. And there's other people that have set their heart to follow the Lord. And they say, come what may, I'm following Jesus and Jesus will do the work. I don't have to do the work. I just got to set my heart to follow him and he will bless whatever he's led me to do. You see? That's the key. We think... And, and, and I want to put this proportionately, and, and you can kind of tell I preach kind of conversationally. If you can't tell that, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, join the conversation. Uh, so, Jesus talks about himself being the head of the body and the body, which is the church, and it's made up of a lot of different parts. Well, the Apostle Paul talks about that, the, 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 and I'm not even sure if the body part's right, but the ear can't look and say, because I'm not the eye. And I think a lot of times in the body of Christ, well, I'm not the pastor, or I'm not a leader, or I'm not the guy that does this, and I'm not the guy that does that. Let me tell you something, it doesn't matter. You follow Jesus, and Jesus will build his kingdom in you and through you if you allow him to do it. Period. Period. I'm not preaching anything new this morning. There's nothing new under the sun. This is a very simple message, but it is a powerful message. And the call to follow the Lord, if, you, if you're taking notes, good luck. Uh, but uh, number one would be this. To follow Jesus is the primary call of every believer. It is the primary call. It's not to preach. It's not to be an intercessor. It's not to be a worship leader. It's not to pick up a, a, an instrument and play it to perfection. It is to follow Jesus. If you swing a hammer, you are to glorify Jesus and to follow Jesus in every aspect of your life. If you're a teacher in the public schools or a Christian schools, you as a believer, you are called to follow Jesus. If you're an accountant, God help you. Follow Jesus. If you work for the IRS, Jesus looks at you and says, who do you say that I am? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Follow Jesus. It doesn't have to be a big song and dance. You just have to be following Jesus. You have to be following Jesus. There is never, because it is the primary call of the believer's life, it is, there is never a situation, it is not okay for us to follow Jesus. And there is never a time in our lives that it's not okay to be following Jesus. As you follow Jesus, it ain't always going to look easy. Did you know that? Did you know that? My family, I have two grown children that go to church here, one that is living in Covington. My parents go here. Other family members that go here. 
I love you. I didn't make the reunion. I love you. Uh, I was getting some sunshine. I ain't going to lie. Uh, so there goes the ADD. I just, it just kicked in. Uh, but the, 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 the reason we ended up here after 10 years at a plant, the Lord just stirred my heart in the fall of 2021 and said, it's time to go. And some of you have heard this, and I'm not going to share it all, and I'm going to share it briefly. And I began to pray, Lord, you know, give some confirmation to that and pray some very specific things. And every one of those, God fully and quickly nailed it. And we just knew it was time for us to leave. And as we prepared for that and tried to prepare the church for that and, and try to leave them in a better place than, than, and, and more prepared place than it was uh, even up to that point, we were expecting to step from that place into the next pastorate. And I think that's a natural thought to have, right? You've been preaching, you've been serving, you've been planting, uh, you know, you, you, you've, you've done this, you've done that. And again, none of that really amounts to a hill of beans outside of it fo- being following the Lord and what he's call, called us to do at that time. And so... I began to, and I, I delayed my, my job search because I didn't want to kind of shock the church even though they knew we were leaving. And uh, began to get job offers as we searched and every one of them are like, man, this looks good. Florida, that sounds great, you know, or, or this place or that place. And every one of them, the Lord would say, nope, not it. Not it. Not it. Begin to get a little stressed out here, Lord. Uh, you need me to take the reins for a while? Uh, now listen, don't think that ain't what wells up in your heart. Am I lying? When the pressure's on and you don't know what the next step is, all you know is that next step's a Lulu. Temptation rises up. And I told Lisa, I said, look, that's my wife, if you don't know, that's my wife. Uh, Lisa, love you. Uh, I said, I'm not going to step out of this church in obedience to step into somewhere out of disobedience. But here's all we knew. God was leading us out, and we had to follow. And at that point, we didn't even know where God was leading us into. All we knew is we had to follow what we knew. Now, as we stepped out, we took a couple of Sundays off. It was nice not to have your phone ringing and those kind of things and people asking you questions on ProPresenter and all those things. Let me, let me tell you something. Those that run the sound in the media, they are, they are praiseworthy. Hallelujah. Uh, those, those that do those things, all the things that you ain't got to think about, give, give God praise for them. Amen? And step, stepped out and took a couple of weeks off and we had a very short list of churches and, and we said, well, this one's the closest to our house. And, uh, we came here and the very first Sunday, the spirit of God was just so manifest here. And, and, uh, my youngest son and my daughter, and my wife and, uh, daughter-in-law, we were here. And I mean, all of us walked out and was pretty much, this is where God wants us immediately. Didn't know where we were going. But we followed the Lord out, and God brought us to a place that we knew that the Spirit of the Lord was. And God had instructed us to be here, and we're here. Now, we don't know fully what that looks like and what that holds, and I'm not going to put any parameters on it. But here's the reason I share that is to share this. You don't always know where the Lord may be leading you, but you got to set your heart to follow Him. You have to set your heart to follow Him. Because it may look exactly like you thought it was going to look like, but chances are it's not. You ask anybody in this room that has set their heart to follow Jesus, I guarantee you they will say at some point in time in their life, it does not look like they thought it would look. But God's faithful. And he's faithful to lead, 
if you'll set your heart and to be faithful to follow. And then when, it, when he gets you where he wants you to be, and in the journey in between, you'll see God's hand and God's blessing and God's favor upon your life. That don't mean you're not going to have problems. So again, good luck. Number two, it's a pricey call. Primary call, follow the Lord. Number two, it's a pricey call. It's pricing. It's a cost to follow. What did Jesus say? He said you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. That deny yourself and take up your cross is dealing with two things that are very difficult for us as people and especially American people. That's comfort and control. Comfort and control. Listen, Jesus has called us to a biblical model of Christianity. Not one that's been polluted by politics. Not one that's been polluted by preferences. Not one that's been polluted by the, 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 the denominational pulls of men one way or another. But the reality, he has called us to follow him. You want to see what, a, what, what you're supposed to look like? Look like Jesus. You want to see the path you're supposed to walk? You follow his path. And guess what? Sometimes that path is hard. Did you know that? It was nothing easy about going the, climbing the hill of Golgotha, bruised and battered and beaten and bleeding, bearing a cross to a hill, but he was going where the Lord had led him. And if it's the way the master trod, the servant should trot it still, as one old timer said. You have to be willing to set your heart. Lord, I set my heart to follow you no matter where you're leading me. Because that's the primary call. And Lord, I set my heart to follow you no matter what that looks like and what that entails. So you have to set your heart the way the Apostle Paul set his heart. He said, look, I know what it's like to be well fed and I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be clothed. I know what it's like to be naked. I know what it's like to be in, 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 in abundance and free. And I know what it's to be like in lack and in chains and in bonds. And you know what? He was following Jesus in it all. And his life bore witness of that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, well, not Jesus said this, but this is scripture, sorry. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Don't sound real comfortable, does it? He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to, puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus was dealing with a couple of things here. We look at that and we think it's harsh. Number one, two of those three guys came to him and said, I will follow you. Well, I remember a guy named Peter who said, Lord, though all forsake you, I will not go. And he went. Even if I have to die with you, this won't happen. And he was nowhere around when it happened. Jesus knows the heart. Jesus knows the heart. And you can make the bold proclamation today that I will follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. Wherever it looks like, uh, whatever it looks like, wherever you lead me, but Jesus knows the heart. And you need to search your heart to be sure that what you say is out of sincerity and out of surrender and says, Lord, here I am, I will follow you. Jesus wasn't criticizing these because there were certain things they needed to do. He knew their heart. He knew their heart. And Jesus never undersold the cost to follow him. He never 
never asked, he, he never played it down. He never acted like it wasn't a big deal. He said, nope, you know what? People will persecute you. People will kill you. There's a point in time where people will kill you, and they think they're doing me, uh, doing the Lord uh, a service. But the reality is God, ne Jesus never undermined the cost, but he never overstated the reward. Hallelujah. He said, if you will follow me, even if it costs you your life, you will gain your life because you followed me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why you have to search your heart. Don't just take these things lightly. When, when you, who, who do you say that I am? Don't just blab off the right answer. God knows the heart. You weigh it. Scripture continues in Luke chapter 14. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not uh, carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And then he goes on and he begins to talk about counting that cost. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king goes out to battle. I'm paraphrasing here. He has to, he has to count the cost. He has to do the work. He has to, and I don't mean that physically uh, 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 ascend to a point where you think you got it. Man, I wore this mic out already. <clears throat> Lord, give life back to this microphone. I'm sorry if I am yelling. I, I don't mean to do that. Uh, you, th that king has to be sure of the choice he's about to make to see if he with 10,000 can line up with the one who has 20,000. Amen? Let me encourage you, if you're serious, you want to count the cost, realize. Even when you stand alone, but you stand with the Lord, you stand in the majority. Did you hear that? When you stand alone, but you're standing with the Lord, number one, you're not standing alone, but you stand in the majority because the Lord is the majority. Thank you. Hold it up high. All right. There it is. There we go. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So if you guys ever speak here, hold it high. Don't block the signal, okay? <laughs> Lord, help me. <laughs> There's a cost to follow the Lord. Something, as the Lord began to lay out this, this message, the verse that really, a couple of verses that really stood out to me, John 21, I'll, I'll just touch this one. He said, this is right after Jesus restores Peter. Peter denied the Lord. Uh, they're out fishing. They come across the Lord. And uh, he asks Peter if he loves him. And as Peter says yes, he says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And then Peter is like, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus begins to commission Peter again, and, but this is something he says, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now think about that. Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. Three times, and three, uh, Peter three times responded, yes, Lord, I love you. And then Jesus begins to tell him what's going to happen in his life. Hey, there's coming a day when you're not going to dress yourself. Somebody's going to come dress you, and they're going to lead you to a place of death. For my name's sake. Think about that. In my office, I, had, I don't even know where I came across the picture, but it was a picture of Peter being crucified upside down. And it said, Peter, the Lord has a beautiful plan for your life. 
And that always struck me because the reality of it is, as horrible it is, it was the plan God had for his life. And because it was the plan that God had for his life, Jesus looks at him and says, now follow me. You don't think so? Read it for yourself. John 21, 19. Then he said to him, follow me. Here's the death you're going to die. And here's, here's what it's going to cost you to follow me. Follow me. Follow me. It's a pricey cost. It's a pricey call. But as believers, we're called to, to, to be willing to lay down our life for the cause of Christ. Are we not? You, if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be willing to give up your comfort and your control. Now, as we've followed the Lord and have found ourselves in this place, this has not been an easy place. Not, not talking about the church, but we have found, and, and actually this is where that message began to shift into another message. And that message, uh, should you ever hear it, is called the blessed wilderness. And really about what the wilderness does and what God's purpose is in the wilderness and what, how we're to conduct ourselves in that, in that time. But over the last year, we found ourselves in a wilderness that's not been easy. It's not the first time we've been in a wilderness. As a matter of fact, uh, it came out of the first church plant. In 2007, and uh, uh, Pastor mentioned Wednesday about Elijah laying down and talking about uh, praying to die. I, I literally did that in that wilderness. I said, God, if this is what it looks like, take the call off my life or kill me. I don't have a choice. I mean, I don't have a preference. I don't care which one. I'd rather you just either take the call because it's not looking the way I wanted it to look or thought it would look. It's very difficult, uh, even though I knew it was going to be hard. I understand, when you're in the wilderness, you know you can express your heart to the Lord. Did you know that? Out of, the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And sometimes it's when it comes off your lips, God's able to put his finger on the heart. That doesn't mean you say it in a wrong spirit. You understand that. And even when you do, you better be holding it loosely and realize that the Lord's going to correct you in that. Okay? But I was praying, God, either take the call off my life or kill me because I'm miserable be, Miserable because I don't know what's next. Similar situation this time, not, not to that extreme because we just simply knew God had let us out. And God had let us here, but it's, been, it's different. It's different. Because you don't know what's next. This, this was 10 years of our lives. This was, this was our routine. This was our, our, to be honest with you, a comfort zone. Even though it was hard and it was what we knew. It was the rut we were in. It was, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that was the rhythm. Maybe that's a better word. The rhythm that we were in. And now we find ourselves in a place of uncertainty. We find ourselves in a place where we're not sure. We don't know what the next step is or when the next step's going to be. Well, let me encourage you here. If you find yourself in a wilderness, he is still a cloud by day and a fire by night. And when the Lord is, when Jesus has said, follow me, he's serious about it. And he's not just serious about your part of it. He's serious about his part of it. That when he says, follow me, that he is faithful to lead you. And when it's dark, he will outshine the darkness. Hallelujah. And when you're in the heat of the day and it's beating down on your brow and you're breaking a sweat and you're dragging yourself in the desert, let me tell you something. He will provide the shade and he will provide the water to restore your soul. He will lift you up and raise you up. And when you're treading through rough sand and you're sinking in, he will raise your feet up to walk on level ground that is easy to tread. It may not be easy in a sense, but it's easy because he bears you up. Hallelujah. So let me encourage you. You find yourself in a wilderness moment. You just keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep on treading. You keep on following. Don't you give up. Don't you turn back. You keep on following. He still, he, if he's faithful to lead you, then you be faithful to follow him. No matter where it looks, no matter where it goes, no matter what it costs, no matter how tired you are, he will lead you and he will give you what you need to follow him. Hallelujah. If you don't think so, think about the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's the earnest, the down payment 
in our lives of the glory to come. Hallelujah. And if he's, and if he's called us to follow him and he's given us his spirit that we can know how to grow in truth and in righteousness and walk the way he's called us to do, is he not giving us everything that we need? He's given us his word to abide by. He says, my sheep know my voice. So he's, he's revealing himself and teaching us. He's given us uh, other believers to help us along the way. Jesus is, it, 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 Jesus is more committed to leading you than you are to follow him. Period. Period. Hallelujah. You don't think following, following the Lord is so pivotal and walking in that path? And again... In every aspect of your life, your job, your home, your private life between the Lord, your private life between the, your spouse and your family and your job and your education, whatever your role is, all of that is to be defined by following Jesus. You're not a, you shouldn't be an accountant. Now, again, I'm not criticizing if you call yourself this. I'm just saying this in the sense of where you hold it in your heart, okay? You should not be a Christian who's an accountant. No, I'm a Christian, a follower of Jesus who is an accountant. I'm not an accountant who happens to be a Christian. I think I said that wrong. Did I mess that up? Man, don't give me a joke. I'll, I'll mess up the punchline. We are followers of Jesus who are other things. As a preacher, I'm a follower of Jesus who happens to be a preacher. You see. Hey, you guys are doing good. It's 1245. Just kidding. I only got four points. I'm halfway through. Two, uh, three, excuse me. Make y'all nervous. Some of y'all just went into intercession. Lord help us. <laughs> Number three, it is a passionate invitation. I was thinking about that call to follow him. I think about when he talked... He, 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 to, uh, I believe it's in the Gospel of John, the first, I think it's the first chapter. It says, two of John's disciples talking about John the Baptist were standing there, and, and John talked about Jesus being the Messiah. And they went and followed him, and they said, Where are you staying? And what did Jesus say? Come and see. And I think about that passionate invitation, and I want you to understand this that with no less love, than the Father had for the world that he sent his Son. And with no less love that Jesus had that he willfully laid his life down on a cross, and with no less love that the Holy Spirit has that he is willing to take up residence in us that we might be called the temple of the Holy Spirit and the dwelling place of the living God, does God with no less love than any of those things does Jesus say, come follow me. His desire is for us to follow him. See, a lot of us in the world have just said, yeah, I believe. Now, Jesus said, if you really believe, you'll follow. It's not easy believism. It's not pray a little prayer, and then that's it. And that's the finish line. I know too many Christians that thinks coming to Jesus is the finish line. No, that's the starting line. Because when you step into faith, that you declare Jesus is Lord, and now, now you begin to follow the leader. And it's funny because you only follow those that you consider to be superior, and we follow the one that's supreme to all things. Hallelujah. The little game isn't just follow anybody, anywhere, anytime. No, it's called follow the leader, and praise be unto God. Jesus is the leader. Hallelujah. It's a passionate call because it's a call to intimacy. It's a call to fellowship and, and to learn from him and to know him and to learn his voice and to uh, sense his presence. And, it, it, and it's a, an invitation into the very presence of the living God. I love that thought. There's nothing like someone... You know, we don't have a teacher, you know, and being a disciple means being a student. And we don't have a, a teacher or a leader or, or a head or a master or, or a Lord that wants to keep us at arm's length. But he says, come. He says, come. And I picture that, like little Jesus having the little children come to him and he begins to bless them. That's what I see. I see us 
I kind of gathered around the Lord, and some of y'all might be crawling on his lap for all I know, but uh, I'll tell you this, if you are, he ain't going to displace you, hallelujah. But he says, come. He says, come. It's in that place of prayer, in that place of worship, that time in his word, that we begin to not only, uh, Scripture talks about that he knows us, we're his sheep. And Jesus said, uh, uh, Talk, talking about his sheep, he says, I know them and they follow me. But it's also where we get to know the shepherd. When we begin to follow the Lord, it's not some groping in the dark. It's the fact that you can only follow one that you can see or that's been revealed. you know that? And Jesus said, I manifest myself to those that love me. He reveals himself so that we can follow. And then lastly... And all God's people said, hallelujah. Y'all wasn't really supposed to do that. I don't know who did it, but no. <laughs> Lord, we just pray that you search the hearts of your people. Tonight. <laughs> and I know I'm random. I know, and not every sermon I preach is this way, so don't just throw me out. <laughs> That's the case. It's a personal invitation. See, I'm working backwards here. Normally, I would have started there. Each one in this room, it doesn't matter if this is a message. It's a gospel message like this. It's being presented to everybody in this room. It is a personal invitation to come and follow me. Not me. I'm talking about as if the Lord would speak. Come and follow. You see it in Mark 1. Andrew and Peter. James and John, the Lord says, follow me. You see it in chapter 2 of Mark, Levi or Matthew, and says, follow me. You see it in John 1 with, with Philip. You see, it, you see this invitation. And when, and, and when the Lord is speaking to your heart, who do you say that I am? It's a personal question for a personal response, but, there's only, but there is a correct response and everything else is wrong. And in tune with that, that, that invitation to follow, there's only one correct response and everything else is error. And that correct response is, Lord, I will follow you. Not on my terms. Not on my time. Not upon the convenience of my schedule. But Lord, I humble myself before you because you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And, and, and what am I that you would take notice of me? But yet you have taken notice of me. And you've invited me into a place of fellowship and relationship with you. So Lord, I set my heart to follow you. I set my heart to follow you. I don't know if I have the authority to do this, but I'm going to do it. Worship team, come on. <laughs> Back in John chapter 21, after Jesus gives Peter the good news of how he's going to die and then tells him how to tells him to follow him, he says this. The word says this. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This is the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I wanted him to remain alive, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. That's a personal invitation to you. It doesn't matter what the person next to you decides to do. It doesn't matter what people may say about what you're about to do. It doesn't matter if it seems like you're going alone. Jesus said, don't you worry about anybody else. It's between you and me. Follow me. Follow me. So...